In Quantic Dreams Detroit Become Human, players are taking on an incredible branching narrative that evolves with your choices. Set in the city of Detroit in the year 2038, you follow the intertwining tales of three androids, exploring the emergence of sapience among the machines. Your actions determine the fate of not only these three, but potentially every android and all of humanity. If you haven't played it or watched a Let's Play, I, I highly recommend you do. It's definitely one of my you know top narrative games of the 2010s. There was a lot that got me enraptured in the world. It's got a lot of provocative, engaging, and thought-provoking commentary weaved throughout its writing. Also, they got the guy who played Mr. Krabs to act as a grizzled Detroit detective, so, you know, that was pretty great. One of the things that got the part of my brain dedicating to overthinking fiction buzzing was how the android saw and navigated the world. This is one of the main protagonists in the game. I would introduce him, but he seems to do a pretty good job of doing that himself. My name is Connor. I'm the android sent by Cyberlife. My name is Connor. I'm the android sent by Cyberlife. My name is Connor. I'm the android sent by Cyberlife. My name is Connor. I'm the android sent by Cyberlife. Without getting into any spoilers, one of the things that you do in the game with Connor is reconstruct prior events at crime scenes in order to figure out what happened. You look around in the environment, investigate stuff, taste stuff. Oh, Jesus, what the hell are you doing? Basically, just gather information to reconstruct what went down. You do so faster and better than the seasoned human investigators could. And this got me wondering, is this really accurate? We know that machines can undertake rope calculations much faster than we can, but something like this is a whole other deal. One's largely limited to how quickly you can get mechanical logic gates to open and close and how many of them you can shove into a single surface. The other ostensibly involves a degree of empathic insight that we've only thought people as being capable of. Can artificial intelligence really pick up on these sorts of clues and outperform people? Is the way that androids see the world in Detroit become human accurate? Yes. And also, no. And that no isn't just because Connor's making some leaps that pure deduction would never be able to justify. Like, really? You've determined the path of the suspect based upon a busted birdcage? I don't know who you think you are, but you ain't Robot Jesus. Because that's Marcus. But before we get into the ways that it's inaccurate, I think we should talk about the way that it is. Namely, that AI is able to make some shockingly accurate determinations about us based upon ostensibly unrelated data. One of my favorite and most provocative examples in this vein comes from a 2017 paper, Deep Neural Networks Are More Accurate Than Humans at Detecting Sexual Orientation from Facial Images, because social scientists are just so creative at naming stuff. As the title suggests, or you know, explicitly states, researchers use deep neural networks to scan over 35,000 facial images from Facebook and online dating profiles. Their neural network was able to correctly classify gay and straight men 81% of the time, and gay and straight women 71% of the time you know, off of just a single image. Humans, however, only got it right 61% of the time for men and 54% of the time for women. Give the machine five pictures of someone and that classification rate jumped at least 10 points for men and women alike. The researchers argued that the machine was picking up on some of the more subtle clues that a person's facial features can give, you know, nose bridge width, eye size, facial hair, etc., that tend to be determined by exposure to certain hormones while in the womb. Hormone exposure, that according to some research, is also correlated to being gay. So it's picking up on those subtle cues and then using them to make a determination as to one's sexuality. We've seen a similar premise to this on the channel before when I showed that Facebook is able to discern our political ideologies based on the stuff that we click on. Just like with faces, the algorithms are taking relatively simple and ostensibly innocuous information and translating that to a reasonably accurate determination of your political standing. So yeah, absolutely, machines can come to decisions on things better than people can, even in areas that we think that we would be able to excel at. What the game gets wrong is in how they portray the connections being made. The way that Connor arrives at his conclusions mirrors the kind of deductive logic seen in Sherlock Holmes. The knife doesn't have fingerprints on it. Humans have fingerprints, but androids don't. Thus, the killer must be an android. Or, you know, a person wearing gloves. In any event, it follows a clear logical chain. A, thus B, therefore C. And while this seems to be the sort of mechanical process that an android would do, it's actually not how AI works in reality. You can obviously forgive the designers for creating a game that, you know, is for humans rather than AI, but it's a sharp departure from how androids would actually see the world. One of the most common ways that AIs operate is through machine learning algorithms, and the way that most machine learning algorithms come to their decisions is through extensive practice. Basically, you have a set of known inputs and outputs. The computer tries its best to guess the outputs based off the inputs alone, and you 
usually does a pretty crappy job at it on the first go. You then use the correct information to let the computer figure out what to tweak in order to optimize its classification. Rinse and repeat a bunch of times on other training data sets, and if all goes well, you've got yourself a machine that can correctly classify data from the real world. I'm obviously skimming over a lot of detail here. For those more interested, I would recommend going to Jabril's, Leos, and 3Blue1Brown and just binging on everything and anything to do with machine learning and artificial intelligence. Speaking from experience, it's time well spent. But here's the rub. We actually don't know why the computer classifies things the way that it does. We know what we give the machine, and we know what the machine spits out, but the way that that data is combined in order to span that gap, that's something we don't know. It's a black box. Take the example of determining sexuality based upon faces that I mentioned earlier. After the paper was released, other researchers noted that the typical gay and straight faces for men and women tended to have differences that weren't contingent upon hormonal explanations, things such as wearing makeup and glasses and the like. And they made a much simpler statistical model using self-reported cosmetic habits and were able to get a comparable level of classification accuracy. The conclusion isn't that the original researchers were picking up on purely cosmetic differences, it's that we don't know if they were or weren't, but it's just as likely a possibility as picking up on the subtle morphological differences that arise due to prenatal hormone exposure. And this lack of transparency can be pretty problematic. Unlike AI, our sole social prerogative isn't minimizing a cost function. We've determined that there are certain concepts that we value over sheer objectivity, chief among those respect for human life and dignity. And it's pretty damn hard to program those in as constraints because we actually can't agree to what they mean, let alone come to a consensus on how to mathematize them. Indeed, this problem is perhaps more pressing now that we've actually come up with some creative ways to peer into the minds, you know, underneath the algorithmic black box. Researchers in AI have come up with some new techniques that inform us on the kinds of logical jumps that the machines are making. And they're nothing like the connections that we would normally make when we're trying to uncover things, or especially when we're trying to keep people's rights in mind. It's not that we shouldn't strive to use AI to tackle difficult social problems. I'm not a Luddite, right? That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm personally of the mindset that we should use every appropriate tool at our disposal to address the pressing social issues of our time. But tools, however appropriate, are only good if the people wielding them are themselves good and actually know what the heck they're doing. And while I'm willing to believe that most people at least try to be good most of the time, AI is so new that there's still a lot that needs to be learned. Ultimately, Detroit Becomes Human paints a pretty accurate picture of what androids would be capable of doing given enough time, training, and data. What it doesn't portray is the fact that these decisions are made in ways that are totally dissimilar to how people navigate them. In this crucial respect, the game fails at giving us a way of understanding how androids would see the world due to the simple fact that there's really no way for us to know right now. Here's to see what you guys think about the use of AI addressing more complex socially oriented questions, AI and machine learning in general, or just stuff about Detroit Becomes Human. I definitely wouldn't mind talking about that. I, I love talking about it. It's just it's just a really good game, you know? Let me know what your thoughts about all those down in the comments. Look forward to reading all of them and answering a few in the next office hours. All right, so I've got a couple of quick announcements. First, I'm going to be taking two weeks off from filming for uh, personal reasons. I'll still be tweeting and commenting and failing to update the blog as often as usual, but there won't be a video on either the 18th or the 25th. There will, however, be one on August 1st. Second, I decided to take a page out of the PBS Digital Studios booklet and put comment responses and regular videos together. I'm doing this for a few reasons. One is to cut back on any sort of subscriber fatigue that comes about from, you know, seeing all the different notifications from multiple videos a week, and it makes it easier for me to produce these videos while working on the early work necessary for my dissertation as well as other research projects. So yeah, without any further ado, let's get into some comment responses. Brain of Britain asked if the concept of religious freedom extended to atheists in the United States. I originally mentioned that it did, but I couldn't think of any cases that dealt with atheism specifically, since a lot of the cases that protected them originated from people who just simply weren't Christian. However, I totally spaced on a huge one that was about atheists specifically, Torcaso v. Watkins in 1961. Roy Torcaso was appointed as a notary public in Maryland, but the Maryland Constitution at the time dictated that a person declare their belief in the existence of God as a requisite to hold public office. Torcaso was an atheist, so thus refused to make that oath and was subsequently fired. The Supreme Court made a unanimous ruling that firing him was unconstitutional constitutional since the state cannot compel one to affirm a belief or a disbelief under the First Amendment. So yeah, like I said, totally spaced on that one, but yeah, that explicitly shows that uh, atheists are protected under the same law here in the United States, that the freedom of religion does extend to them in, in the negative direction, I guess. Jace the Deck Builder voiced his hope that somebody picked for the Supreme Court
support to fill uh, Kennedy's opening seat would at least be competent. Since then, there's actually been an official nominee made by President Trump, and that is Brett Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh is definitely a conservative, but he actually clerked for Kennedy and has been on the U.S. Court of Appeals since 2006. His appointment would still make Chief Justice Roberts the ideological middle of the court, but Kavanaugh is much more like a Kennedy than a Scalia ideologically, and he definitely has a lot of legal experience. Provided that he's confirmed, all measures suggest that this really isn't going to push the court all that much to the right. So yeah, just a quick little update on that, since again, I'm not going to be able to produce a full-fledged video talking about that, because again, personal reasons, no films over the next two weeks. Dorian Sapiens offered one potential way that standing could be achieved in the gerrymandering cases, a class action lawsuit made by those affected in the districts, and asked if there are other ways that people could, you know, get legal standing or, or firm legal standing. I think that his idea of a class action suit is really interesting, and I think that if this case doesn't work, that something like that is going to be a feasible next step, especially since the decision now makes this issue more of, of an individual level one as opposed to a statewide one. Although Chief Kagan's dissent argues that you could still have group-oriented ways of standing, which might be how future cases are decided that try to use that kind of group-oriented thinking, I, I honestly don't know. I think it's a good idea, although I'm personally disappointed that they didn't actually come up with a firm ruling on it and that's even something that we need to be speculated upon but you know like i said that's that's just me that'll do it for this week thank you guys so much for your comments i look forward to seeing your thoughts on today's video or thoughts for future topics i'm always open to those or you know just thoughts in general if you just wanted to say hi you know i'm cool with that hi sources for everything that we talked about as always will be down in the doobie doo as well as links to facebook to and blog look forward to seeing you guys out there as well if you enjoyed this video I hope you consider giving it a thumbs up if you want to support the channel you can do so by commenting down below by sharing this video by subscribing to the channel stay in the loop for more awesome social science content is uploaded if you want to be guaranteed to be in the loop when i upload a new video be sure to click the bell icon as well as always thank you guys so much for watching i'll see you next time